We're sitting down with local journalists to review the results of Nevada's 81st legislative session. This week on Nevada Week. Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt and additional supporting sponsors. The final month of our state's 81st legislative session appeared to be a busy one as hundreds of bills and budget considerations made their way through both houses. Now this flurry of activity coincided with our legislative buildings relaxing COVID related in-person restrictions, news of encouraging economic projections, and also a healthy sum of federal relief coming to our state. We'll discuss how successful the legislation was at finalizing the state's two-year budget. Also, with roughly a thousand bills and resolutions introduced this session, we'll discuss some of the big wins and losses and what moves the legislation made that might matter to you the most. Also, many bills signed by the governor today could have implications years or decades down the road. We'll talk to our journalists about what bills might have significant long-term impact on our state. And finally, What's next for our legislators before midterm elections and the 82nd legislative session gets underway in 2023? We'll talk about this as well. Please welcome Riley Snyder, reporter for the Nevada Independent, Colton Lockheed, reporter for the Las Vegas Review Journal, and Michael Lyle, reporter for the Nevada Current. Well, welcome to Nevada Week and welcome, thank you so much. Welcome back, I should say, Michael, Riley, Colton, for joining us again. What a last busy week. Of course, I think that was expected, but let's not forget that we had three full months, three and three quarters full months before that last week. So let's think of this more collectively. Michael, I wanted to go to you first. Big takeaways this session. What should the public be most aware of here? I think the session was supposed to be a response to a couple different issues. One, the pandemic and also the racial injustice that happened throughout the summer and all the protests uh, they declared last summer in a special session that racism was a public health crisis and so i think the takeaways were the follow-up to that as far as pandemic legislation one of the bigger bills that transpired at the end of the session was one to connect the eviction proceedings to rental assistance applications as you know the eviction moratorium just lifted on monday and so there was a lot of anxiety throughout the session leading up to what they what legislators and lawmakers and activists knew was going to be the end of the moratorium so i think a big takeaway is how they responded to covid and the housing crisis and the eviction crisis that happened in the last year and so that hmm. the big bill that came out of that was this bill connecting eviction proceedings and rental assistance making sure that people that are waiting for rental assistance i think last numbers clark county was backlogged by nine thousand applications. So connecting the application process to get rental assistance to eviction proceedings so you do not get locked out while you're waiting for eviction. So that was one of the bigger takeaways, I think, of the, the session. If I can jump in, I just wanted to ask you um, that that was one of the one of the bills that one of the last minute bills. Of course, we saw similar bills throughout our entire legislative session that were not maybe as successful there. were not successful. Let's talk about this bill particularly from the tenant perspective and the, the property manager perspective here. Does this bill get it done enough so that when we get into this major, uh, the meat of these eviction cycles here, uh, both are going to be protected? I think legal groups feel that this is the solution. This is the answer to the question, how do we safely lift the eviction moratorium and help both the renter and the property manager? I mean, landlords want to get paid. And so this ensures that people that are seeking rental assistance that are, have their applications in queue not only get their backlog of rent pays, but making sure that that landlords also have access to these funds as well. So I think this is the the solution. I don't. Some of the other tenant bills that failed were long term solutions that that answers the other question: what happens after the eviction moratorium? After what happens months down the road from the eviction moratorium? What's the future of of housing issues and tenant protections? So those didn't really make it across the finish line those barely <laughs> even uh made it out of committee in some cases but um i think in the short term yes we kind of answer that question that solves both landlord 
concerns about getting paid and renter concerns of how not to get forced out. Yeah, and one of those one of those bills you're talking about, of course, is the the bill on summary evictions that then went to a study and still wasn't successful. We'll talk about that, I think, at the the end of the show. Colton, I wanted to go to you um, again. Uh, what are some of the big takeaways for you? I think for me, really going into the session, dating back to last year and even during the special sessions last year, everything was looking forward to looking at what the budgets were going to look like, how bad the pandemic was going to hurt the budgets, and how bad the state's coffers were going to be pinched due to the you know the economic downturn, the fact that pretty much casinos were shuttered through a good chunk, if, if not shuttered, completely empty uh, through much of 2020. Uh, and then around the middle of session, we get the, you know, around May, I think it was actually, uh, early May, we get the economic forum number. All of a sudden there's 600 million more dollars to work with. The budgets are now looking quite a bit rosier. And all of a sudden we go from looking at how the state's going to be cutting, cutting, cutting to what do we do with all this money? And you know, rather than looking at big cuts to education, like we were looking at in 2020 and in those special sessions, now it was looking at how can the state better fund education? Where can they put more money? How can they better protect people? And that's not even talking about the, you know, the $2.7 billion or so coming into the state from the, you know, the new federal relief package. And right. it really kind of, in a matter of four months, we really managed to completely flip that conversation on its head and look, now we're really looking at how can the state and kind of prepare itself financially for the future. Yeah, and let's talk about some of the, the cuts here and then the, the balanced budget, as you mentioned, one of the requirements of our of our legislation. Um, of course, unemployment, unemployment trust fund was at $2 billion prior to the pandemic. That was almost depleted. Uh, we had $400 million in our rainy day fund uh, gone, uh, and then additional state cuts. Riley, let's go to you with this question. With the balanced budget, have a lot of those that uh, funds that have been depleted been replenished here? Yeah, so um, there's been a lot of questions and discussion about what kind of the plan is for that $2.7 billion of federal American Rescue Plan money that the state is in line to get. And that's only like kind of a small part of the money Nevada is going to holistically get from the federal government through the American Rescue Plan. I think the actual dollar, when you count out all the buckets and direct appropriations, is closer to $6 billion. So uh, lawmakers were kind of in a weird spot where we have a 120-day session. We knew we had to end on Monday at midnight but we didn't have the treasury guidance and kind of like the answers to all the questions as to how the state can spend this money. What, what are the appropriate uses? What would you get in trouble with with the federal government if you spend it for certain things? So in kind of the final days and weeks of session, um, lawmakers introduced a bill that they call a funding waterfall. So it's basically just kind of like a line by line list of like, here's what we know we wanna spend the federal money on once it's transferred to the state. And the first thing on that list was refilling the unemployment trust fund. I think there was a desire among the governor's uh, team and among lawmakers um, to refill that because when the state's unemployment trust fund is depleted, we borrow money from the federal government and businesses that pay into the unemployment trust fund have to pay a higher unemployment rate to help make up for those uh, payments. So this is something we saw in the last recession in 2008, right, where that higher rate affected businesses negatively um, because they were trying to make up like a, a pretty massive deficit because we've been paying out millions and millions in unemployment benefits every month. So um, that's sort of like the the top line thing um, that lawmakers want to use that federal money for um, was to balance that. Uh, there were other discussions about how to balance the rainy day fund or to restore that. We kind of tapped into our $400 million in the reserve account during the summer special session to balance the budget. Um, there's a small problem where the guidance says you can't use the, the, the federal money to backfill that. So um, there's, I think, a, a little bit of creative accounting that's going to go on between now and any potential future special session on how they're going to, to, to meet that financial need. And Colton, maybe we just jump ahead and let's talk about the future of a special session here. Uh, we have this waterfall bill, of course. It doesn't sound like that's going to take care of um, allocating all of our um, American Rescue Plan funding, particularly. Uh, so are we going to be seeing a special session, particularly for some of this federal relief? I mean, it sounds like there's a, I think even Speaker Frierson on signing die on the final day of the session, right after everything ended, he indicated that that waterfall bill is not enough to kind of get them through the, to, to allocate all the money eventually. Uh, and talking to the, the governor the day after, it sounds like the plan is that this will kind of bridge the gap or bridge a few months. And then we'll probably see a special session sometime, you know, late summer, early fall. At least that's the kind of sense that I get specific to the American Rescue Plan or kind of the spending that money. And then obviously potentially another special session later in the year for redistricting. 
Let's transition the conversation here. I want to talk about, um, of course, um, our, our legislators, uh, the leadership of our legislation, um, both um, Senate and Assembly, majority and minority leaders prioritize certain bills. Of course, our governor does as well. Um, and other executive leadership like our attorney general also prioritize bills. Let's talk specifically about what some of the big wins or losses have been there for our state leadership. Michael, let's start with you. Kind of going back to that public uh, racism as a public health crisis uh, declaration, I think some of the response that we saw from our elected leaders kind of addressed that issue. I think from Attorney General Ford, we saw uh, a partial ban to no-knock warrants. It actually just sets up more stipulations before law enforcement can can carry out a no-knock warrant that was inspired by the Breonna Taylor case out in Kentucky, who was uh, tragically killed last uh, March of 2020 uh, during a no-knock warrant raid. And then also a patterns and practice bill that allows the attorney general to um, look at systemic issues within police, uh, police uh, within law enforcement. And so I think those are some big wins that directly respond or a direct response to what was happening over the summer and some of the racial injustice that we were seeing. Hmm. And I wanted to, to note uh, one, one successful bill, bill, AB 116, decriminalizing uh, minor traffic tickets, a clone of several other bills that have been proposed throughout uh, previous sessions. Uh, it seems like, I think, it, I think four was the count prior to it successful. And then we got a unanimous vote in both houses, close to a unanimous vote, I should say. What was the difference this time versus some of the past sessions? We definitely had way more support. I mean, from the get-go, we saw that Speaker uh, Frierson and Majority Leader Cannizzaro were, were both sponsors. So I think that signified that was a huge, a few, huge will to actually get this bill passed. And so I think that was the biggest note. Like you said, this has been something that activists and lawmakers have been trying to push through for about four or five sessions. And so I think just more data around it. We also saw Carson City essentially did this. They essentially decriminalized it for the most part and don't uh, send out warrants on, on on minor traffic violations. And so we saw the data on that and we saw it was working in one smaller city. And so I think a combination of that plus a, a new group actually set up too. I mean, Mass Exploration was working on that ahead of time uh, to get the to get decriminalization of traffic tickets for for years, but we saw the fines and fee center also set up shop here in in uh, Nevada trying to get that bill passed. So I think a combination mm -hmm. combination of things of wanting to respond to racism as a public health crisis because we saw traffic tickets and warrants for uh, warrants for traffic tickets were overly burdened in black and brown communities. We saw more lawmakers signing on. We saw more data, and we just saw more activism. So I think that combination inspired. I guess, this bill to actually get across the finish line. Yeah, and, and great points. And it seems like there were other bills that hadn't been successful in previous sessions that also followed um, similar attributes there and were successful. Colton, you wanted to add something. Yeah, just uh, kind of to Michael's point about the, the Carson City aspect of this, but uh, the biggest the big, biggest opponent to these the decriminalizing these have actually been, historically been the courts. The courts have been, they basically build a lot of their budgets off of these, you know, these traffic tickets and and they were they've been worried for years that that by reducing these to civil to civil offenses that they're going to see a, a drastic cut in their budgets and then when carson city did it um at least from the data we've seen they've actually seen an uptick in collections overall because people have, they'll they still they don't lose their jobs you know they don't lose their homes they they're able to pay the tickets rather than getting stuck in a cycle of kind of perpetual incarceration um, stemming from you know a, a traffic ticket, a, a busted tail light, or something like that, they're actually able to pay those eventually over time. And so I think Carson City ended up seeing, I think, what was it, like an eight percent uptick in collections by switching to this. So of course we're actually seeing a little bit better collection overall. Interesting, Riley. I wanted to get your perspective too. Big wins, big losses for state leadership this uh, this session. Yeah. So two, I want to mention um, one big healthcare one that my colleague Megan Messerly has done a great job covering is the state-based uh, public health option. This was a huge push. It got a ton of pushback from hospital associations, a lot of healthcare providers. It was one of the bigger battles at the final days of session. But what it requires essentially is for insurers to offer kind of a state-sponsored uh, uh, public option on the Silver State Health Insurance Exchange. Starting in 2026, there's an actuarial study built in. Um, the governor told us on 
Tuesday, I think. <laughs> it's been a long week um, that he plans to sign it. But Nevada is going to be either the second or third state. Colorado has similar legislation to adopt a state-based public health option. So that was a big push for a lot of progressive groups um, and a lot of folks. That was a bill from Senator uh, Nicole Cannizzaro, the Democratic Senate Majority Leader. And that was one of her big priorities to get done this session. And the other one I wanted to mention, um, you know, we, we, we tracked everything that Governor Sisolak put forward in his uh, State of the State address and kind of his campaign promises on our website. We call it the Sisolak Promise Tracker. And he got almost everything he wanted. I think the big one, we're probably going to like talk about this a little bit more, is innovation zones. It was kind of uh, fleshed out. There was a draft bill sort of circulated around in February, but it never got the support it needed. It turned into a study. Still a lot of questions um, around that proposal. A lot of skepticism from Story County, from lawmakers on both sides of the aisle about this mm -hmm. idea to like let companies set up their own counties within a county. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest, uh, uh, you know, black eye on the governor's legislative agenda. He did get most of it done, which is helpful when your political party controls all three branches of government. But um, yeah, I think Innovation Zones is probably one of the, the bigger uh, misfires for the governor this session. We have, of course, two years uh, until our next le legislative session. As you mentioned, we might have a special session here. Um, a lot of time to talk about Innovation Zones and potentially start some of the pieces that are in that bill related to the study. Are we gonna hear about Innovation Zones here moving forward quite a bit, Riley? So uh, innovation zones are going to be studied by this interim panel of lawmakers and stakeholders. The idea is to kind of dig into some of these issues. Uh, my colleague Daniel Rothberg at the Nevada Independent did some wonderful reporting uh, during the legislative session about potential issues with water management for Blockchains LLC, the company behind this innovation zone proposal to build their like idealized technology utopia city out in Story County. Um, so there's going to be uh, a lot of those meetings and more discussion about the concept. I just think that the governor's team, and legislative leaders knew kind of like heading into April, May, that the votes weren't there. This is going to be too heavy of a policy lift with everything else that the, the legislature has to take care of um, over the final weeks of session. You mentioned water. Let, let's talk a little bit more broadly just about climate strategy here, Colton. I wanted to go to you to talk about this. Uh, we did have some successful bills uh, that, that pushed through uh, water management and also climate strategy, probably the biggest one being SB 448 that provides this larger infrastructure that could allow more uh, renewable energy to come in to our state. Uh, but there there were some some failures too. the biggest one being a planning bill for the removal or slow removal of natural gas, one of the big pieces of the governor's climate strategy. Talking to some of the environmental groups here, uh, as far as overall look at this, uh, was this a win or, or a loss for uh, climate strategy here? I think overall, it's probably looked at as at least a step forward. Um, with the climate strategy, they have time with the governor's climate strategy. It's like, a, I think, the, especially with the natural gas kind of re, uh, rollback or kind of reduction, it's a 30 year plan effectively. Um, but overall with the, you know, with the transmission lines, uh, kind of expedi expediting of the transmission line projects, um, kind of the addition of the, uh, the electric vehicle charging stations, uh, kind of creating this like, you know, electric vehicle highway. I, I think they're looked at generally as a win. Some groups have been a little bit more critical. Some of the more progressive environmental groups are a little more critical of it. Um, but overall, I think it's a win. But it is that, you know, a lot of people do look at that bill that you mentioned. Uh, there was Assembly Bill 380 um, from Leslie Cohen that uh, in part helped, would have kind of aligned with the governor's climate strategy to reduce natural gas usage in commercial and residential buildings by something like 95% by 2050. Um, and that bill just didn't really uh, garner enough support. Um, and even though it looked like it aligned with it, the governor actually said uh, on Tuesday that he, there were some concerns about kind of the, the costs associated with that and about the effect that that could have, especially on lower income, um, on lower income uh, residents, uh, just effectively trying to force that uh, that implementation. Yeah, and so much retrofit that would need to need to be required to do that. Uh, Riley, you had, you want to add, please. Yeah, so I've covered energy issues like since 2017. And I think my big takeaway from this legislative session is like kind of the, the, the low hanging fruit in the clean energy world, like it's getting plucked. And now it's kind of the harder mm -hmm. thing. So we did a lot of reporting on like this really intense lobbying campaign that Southwest Gas did to kill this Leslie Cohen natural gas planning bill. And they were successful. Um, you know, they got it a bunch of labor groups. Uh, rural communities, they were able to, you know, kind of convince lawmakers this was the wrong step at the wrong time. 
And as Colton said, um, you know, Governor Sisolak kind of doubled down and said, I still believe in the state climate strategy. But I think lawmakers are starting to run, and we started to see it this session in the death of bills that would have required more energy efficiency planning on NV Energy's behalf, that like kind of the easier quote unquote things like raising the renewable portfolio standard, kind of um, moving towards more solar energy, um, we're, we're kind of tapping out on that and to meet carbon reduction goals that are in state statute to get to zero net carbon by 2050. There's going to be a lot of like these kind of hard conversations. You know, it's a question of is Nevada going to follow California and ban, um, you know, gas combustion engines at a certain point? Are we willing to take that step to ban natural gas in commercial or residential buildings? So it's something that I'm very interested in. And, and I think this is going to continue to be a conversation, probably a little bit more heated heading into future legislative sessions. Yeah. And, and as you mentioned, there needs to be some big moves, whether it's natural gas or some other type of fossil fuel to get to those numbers. Uh, last conversation point I want to bring up here. Um, what bills, big or small, we've talked about some of the big, big bills here, but let's not forget that there are um, hundreds of bills that have been passed, um, will have, could have the biggest impact down the road. Michael, what have you been tracking? I think kind of going back to the eviction proceedings, that's going to be a huge thing coming out of this, this session. So I think the passing of Assemblyman Howard Watts's Assembly Bill 141 that automatically seals automatically seals eviction records for non-payment of rent that happened during the pandemic. I think that's going to have a huge impact on the community. This is gonna, this other bill is going to have a huge impact, but it's going to have an impact on inmates, and it's not something that's talked about a lot. But Senate Bill 22 last September, the Department of Corrections increased deductions of taking about 80% of inmates accounts. So if a family member sends them $100, Department of Corrections would take 80% off. And so uh, a bill actually capped that. It's something that will probably fly under the radar, not a lot of reporting on, but it's a huge thing uh, for adding some protections to, to prisoners and uh, giving them some, pro some protections. That's a huge win, I think. I know it's a smaller bill, but I think it's a big win for that community. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Colton Riley, I wanted to go to you. We haven't talked about the mining tax bill. I'm hoping you'll bring that up simply because uh, a lot of legislators have said it is one of the signatures or the signature landmark bill of the session. Um, but I'm not going to put words in your mouth. Colton, let's go to you first. What's a big bill that you've been tracking could have big impact in the future here? So I think the mining tax is obviously uh, kind of a uh, been called a historic um, kind of moment for especially for democrats it's one of the bigger taxes but there's a bill i think in, on the environmental side that i think will have one of the biggest impacts and even environmental groups are saying it's one of the biggest water conservation efforts they've seen in the state potentially in you know decades and that's uh, happens to be another bill from assemblyman howard watts uh, that's ab 356 which will require the re effectively the removal of commercial quote unquote non-functional turf so the turf that you see in like street medians and commercial plazas and things like that around ho around like uh, community like neighborhoods like the hoa communities that have grass like the non-functional decorative grass uh basically have require the removal of the, all of that grass that can't be used colorado river water cannot be used to irrigate that um, starting in 2027, like January 1st, 2027. And that will potentially save 12 billion gallons of water um, annually. Um, that's a big number considering that's about 10, that's about 10 of the water that Southern Nevada is allocated by the Colorado River. And the Colorado River makes up more than 90% of all water in Southern Nevada, like all water usage in Southern Nevada. And that's huge, effectively, it's essential, uh, that's huge, especially since we are in the middle of this decades long drought. We are facing a federal water shortage for the first time since Lake Mead is now expected to drop to a certain level. And that'll trigger a reduction in how much water Southern Nevada gets. So this is a bill that, you know, down the line, talking not just five years from now, 10 years, 20 years, this is something that will have a massive impact on Southern Nevada's ability to conserve water. And as you mentioned, just commercial, that does not affect uh, personal homeowners. Riley, we have about a minute left. I wanted to go to you to uh, big impact down the road. Yeah, let me try to summarize mining taxes in one minute. So this was the big <laughs> compromise legislation. Um, it was intense negotiations at the very end. I think it was surprising. I wrote about this in a story that published today. But tax discussions have often failed at the end of legislative sessions because there's a lot of ass and sort of like the sausage making goes a little haywire. And like the plane landed smoothly this time. So the mining tax bill is going to, um, you know, in future uh, budget cycles, allocate about $300 million between this new excise tax on gold and silver mines and dedicated net proceeds of minerals tax 
to education specifically. It goes straight to the, the distributed school account or whatever that education budget is now. And I think it's helpful to think of this in tandem with the K-12 budget change. One thing we haven't really talked about is that we're moving to a new education funding formula for the first time in 50 years. This is like years and decades of work to try to get us to this point. So I think there's going to be a lot of talk and discussion about how do we ramp up uh, K-12 base funding, like the per pupil funding, to a level that's near the national average. We saw the Commission on School Funding, which is dedicated at looking at the formula. And they said, you know, we need up to $2 billion over the next 10 years to get us to the national average on per pupil funding. So lawmakers took a lot of steps this session, but that's going to be something that we see moving forward as a discussion point. Absolutely. And we, we ran out of time. I apologize. Uh, maybe we have some of you back and we talk about the mining tax related to education funding uh, in general. Michael, Riley, Colton, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, as always, for joining us this week on Nevada Week. Now, for any of the resources discussed on this show, please visit our website at vegaspbs.org slash Nevada week. You can also find us on social media at Nevada Week. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week.